everybody. Hope your week is off to a good start on this Tuesday. Glad to have you with us for NFL Live. Wendy Nix, Dan Graziano, Tim Hasselbeck, and Coach John Fox. Coming off the Eagles' loss to the Saints on Sunday, that did mean the end of their season. Nick Foles now faces an offseason of uncertainty, while Carson Wentz recovers from a back injury. Doug Peterson addressed the Eagles' quarterback situation earlier today. Carson is the quarterback going forward. Um, and in Nick's case, listen, we, we, we'd love to have everybody back um, throughout the roster. But as I've said many, many times, you know, it's not about one guy. You know, it's about the team, and we're going to do what's best for the team. We would love to keep Nick Foles. I mean, um, you talk about a guy who um, we've we drafted here and we've grown incredibly close with. I mean, I don't know a team that wouldn't want to have Nick Foles on their roster. I would love to lead a, lead a team. Um, you know, the starter thing, like leading a team, impacting a locker room, um, you know, that, that's something that, you know, that's why we play the game. No matter what happens, it's been a joy being here every single day, being in this locker room, wearing, wearing this jersey, being a part of the city. Um, but we'll see what happens. Well, it's the Carson Wentz, Nick Foles question, take two. We know the answer after the offseason last year. Coach, in your estimation, are the Eagles handling this the right way by getting out in front at this point and saying it's Carson Wentz going forward? Yeah, I think Doug Peterson handled it perfectly, and I think he is the direction of the future of that franchise. And, you know, not slighting anything Nick Foles did. I mean, what a wonderful – I mean, just listen to his comments, the teammate he is, what he's accomplished. You know, it's easy to see why he was the MVP of the Super Bowl a year ago. So, uh, tough situation, but I think they're handling it correctly. Obviously, he's a pretty popular guy, Tim, <laughs> and in Philly for obvious reasons. But you can also understand his desire to, as he said, lead a team. Oh, 100%. Look, he's never viewed himself as a backup. Even when he went there, I don't think he's ever seen himself that way. And, uh, look, I, I agree with Coach in that they're handling it the proper way because, you know, as much as you look at him, like, oh, this magical run and this and that, you know, Carson Wentz is a younger player. They're going to build around him. There's no question about that. But you also are dealing with people. And even last year, hearing Carson Wentz talk about, uh, you know, after Nick Foles had won a Super Bowl and was the MVP, when asked about the situation, so it's going to work out great because everybody knows their role on this team and things like that. And whether it's intended to be or not, it's a shot at Nick Foles. It's, it's like, hey, I'm the first rounder. I'm the future of this organization. I'm the quarterback. The interesting thing for Nick going forward will be is he's experienced going somewhere else where he's thinking it might be the same as Philadelphia. And it wasn't. And he was miserable. And because of that, he's not just going to go chase the, the, the best financial offer, he's going to want to go somewhere where he wants to be with the coaches, where he, he is surrounded by guys that he wants to be around and wants to be teammates with, and he's going to enjoy going to work every day. It, but listen, it doesn't matter for all guys. It matters for Nick, and I think that it'll, that will drive his decision. I don't think this game had been over by in a matter of minutes before I started getting questions. What do you think they get for Foles? Does Foles move on? What do they get? So I'll ask you who watches the market closely, what will the market be for Nick Foles? We're not in as dire a league-wide quarterback situation as we were a couple of years ago. There, there are a lot of teams that feel like they have their answer, be it short-term, long-term, or both. But there are some teams that are going to be looking. You know, Jacksonville's a team that feels like it's ready to win now. And, and plugging in a proven playoff winner to a team that has a strong roster, that will be tempting. You know, Miami's looking for a long-term answer. I, I think there are, you know, the Giants in the Eagles division uh, might be looking for you know what's next after Eli Manning if they decide to move on from him if he doesn't want to take a pay cut etc cetera, etc cetera. so there will be a market for him uh, to Tim's point I think what you're gonna have to offer him is you know a chance to compete and a chance to be the starter I mean if, I don't think the Eagles are gonna bring him back on a 20 million dollar option to be their backup which means that if he stays in Philadelphia it's probably gonna be for less money than that so I, I agree that he's not necessarily gonna chase the last dollar but the idea of being get, making starting quarterback money versus making backup quarterback money I think is going to have some appeal I, I'm just being honest with you. Spend time with him. Like, yeah, I don't think the, weird, not I don't think the money. Kind of I don't think the money is going to be the driver. Yeah. he's gone somewhere, and he he literally didn't like football. Yeah, he wanted nothing to do with with football at that point. He he, he it was a part of his life that he was ready to just push away. He wasn't enjoying it, and I think that listen, twenty million dollars a year or whatever the deal is. I, I don't think that's the motivating factor for him. I, I, I really don't. And so a situation where it's an offense that he knows yeah. and likes and, and wants to be a part of with people that he wants to be coached by and have relationships with, 
will have a bigger impact than the money. I also think he's a pretty honest guy. And in those comments we just heard, he sounds like someone who wants to give this a shot as a starter, yeah. be it in Philadelphia or somewhere else, because he's proven that he can win at a high level as a starting quarterback. So I think he'd like a chance for, to, to be his team, and I, I think that's probably better for him at this point than coming back to be Carson Wentz's backup and, and uh, you know, maybe he gets hurt again in December. Well, I'm, I'm always hesitant to use the word deserved because I do think it's a meritocracy, and that's a great thing about the NFL. But he, he has at least earned the right to see what he can do no outside of Philadelphia. There I think we can all agree with that. There are quarterbacks who have gotten good contracts for a lot less. Proven a yeah, lot listen, less you listen to some good names, agree. let's be honest. The Redskins, the, the yeah. Denver Broncos, right. plenty of opportunities for him. No question. Now we will talk about the quarterback that beat the Eagles on Sunday. You've got to prove it each and every week, and you're only as good as your next performance. And that will always be my mindset. Get ready to party with the Lombardi. The Saints have won the Super Bowl. Another touchdown pass for Drew Brees. Drew Brees passes Johnny Unitas. Move over Marino. There's a breeze coming through the door. Drew Brees in rare air. The all-time single-season NFL passing record. It's been an incredible journey. I don't take for granted a single moment. You know what? Today we all celebrate. We got balloons after all, with good reason. Happy birthday, Drew Brees, the Saints quarterback, 40 years old today. Likely, I would venture to guess, spending his birthday getting ready for the Rams who come calling on Sunday. So, I mean, you got Tom Brady now, 41, almost 42. Drew Brees at 40. Coach, it does not seem as if this guy, or either of them for that matter, are slowing down. No, not at all. I think, uh, you know, the Sean Payton and Drew Brees team has been pretty good. And, you know, they got to hoist one Lombardi, and uh, now they're in the, in the running, you know, another big obstacle ahead into getting that second one. Yeah, I'm guessing there's only one thing he wants for his birthday, and that <laughs> would come first on Sunday and then another win two, two weeks wins, later. Right? Two yeah. more wins, that's no exactly right. Look, he's, uh, this is a guy at 40 years old, no signs of slowing down. We hear a lot about what Tom Brady is doing to prolong his career. We hear nothing from Drew Brees about what he's doing to prolong his career. I think he likes it that way. I think he, I think he wants to leave that to Tom and just continue to do it quietly. But I, I would not be surprised to see this guy play another couple of years, even if they cash in with the Super Bowl this year. All right. What he does is he trains with Darren Sproles in the offseason, and since his <laughs> shoulder surgery, He's just been relentless with how he's trained and taking care of his body. And I actually believe that he's been a better thrower of the ball since his shoulder surgery because of the way that he's ended up re just attacking the rehab and then just staying on it. And so, and then you just factor in the, you know, that he's been undersized and all of those things. What he's accomplished has been crazy. Well, no matter how he spends the day today, we know exactly where he'll be and what he'll be doing on Sunday. So let's look ahead to the weekend. Four teams still standing. We'll focus right now, though, on Drew Brees, his Saints team, going up against the Los Angeles Rams. It will be a meeting for the second time this season. And just a reminder, we'll look back at what happened in Week 9. The 6-1 and one Saints hosting a then-undefeated Rams team. There's Alvin Kamara rushing up the middle into the end zone. The Saints take a 35-14 lead. Third quarter, Jared Goff tackled, connects with Malcolm Brown, who tiptoes along the sideline into the end zone. It's just funny seeing Malcolm Brown. Their offense has changed, obviously, when Todd Gurley's not in the lineup. You know, they don't have a pass catcher. Now they've got a hammer in the backfield. It's a ball game in the fourth quarter, third and one in the 41. Golf to Todd Gurley. He throws to Cooper Cup. He'll take it in for the score. They get the two points. And so we start all over again. It is a tie game at 35 all. Saints leading by three here, third and seven of the 28. Drew Brees to Marcus Peters to Michael Thomas for the touchdown. Saints with the 10 point advantage, 45 to 35. Thomas finished with 211 receiving yards. Well, that was the plan. They were gonna travel Marcus to him and, and that was fine by us. You know, we thought we really like that matchup uh, a lot. Tell Sean Payton, keep talking that shit. We're going to see him soon. You feel me? Fair enough. Yeah, because I like what he was saying on the sidelines, too. So tell him keep talking that shit, and I hope you see me soon. You feel me? And then we're going to have a good little, nice little bowl of gumbo together. 
All right then. Okay. We'll see. They like it a lot. Love it. Two minutes left. <laughs> Saints decide to go for it. Four and one on the 41. It's Kamara again. And here's what Sean McVay had to say about the loss. You find out about yourself when you have a little bit of adversity. And I know that everybody in that locker room is going to respond the right way. Have full confidence in that, Gary. Sometimes setbacks can be setups for comebacks. Fair enough. Saints beat the Rams 45-35. to And that did set up this. The Saints hosting the Rams on Sunday in the NFC Championship game. Of course, Los Angeles hoping for a different outcome. The Saints are fine with what happened. How do you stop Drew Brees at home? Well, I think there's going to be three key areas. I think the red area, whereas in the last meeting, you know, uh, New Orleans was 5 of 5 in the red area. Third down is going to be critical for both teams. And in the last matchup, uh, New Orleans was 7 of 12 on third down. And really, along with it, it's going to be time of possession. Uh, the last time the Rams only ran the ball 19 times on the game, they have to establish the run better to keep Drew Brees off the field. And I think. Those three areas are going to be the ingredients. Mm -hmm. We'll talk a lot about the running game this week, and rightly so. But if I said to you, Tim, this game will come down to Jared Goff's arm, Ooh. how confident would you be? Uh, I probably have the least amount of confidence of the guys that are still playing. I mean, I would put it that way. And that's not to say that Jared Goff's not good enough to get it done. He most certainly is. I think he's a good enough player to win a Super Bowl. But he needs a lot of help. He's the kind of guy that, in, in his game and the stuff they do on offense, the run game is really where everything does start for them. They're viewed as a finesse team, but they really are a run first team. So much of their run action stuff comes off of that. Sean McVay is very creative with some of the stuff that he designs off of their run action. And so if they're relying on him to, to drop back and throw it 40 times, then I think they end up losing the football game. All right, so we'll talk about the run game, Dan. I'm sorry, Todd Gurley, C.J. Anderson have been dominant. I would assume they're going to work both these guys in. They want to see both. Yeah, they, they do because they're really sort of pleasantly surprised by what they've gotten out of C.J. Anderson. This is a guy they signed because they had concern over Todd Gurley's knee. Because as Tim mentioned, Malcolm Brown, their backup, was lost for the season. And they believed Gurley might miss some games, which he did. So they brought in Anderson, who's got some experience as a starter, you know, catch the ball a little bit out of the backfield. You know, not going to be Todd Gurley, but can replace him in some key areas, especially in terms of that early down running. Played great, so they worked him into the game plan against Dallas, which was obviously run heavy. They ran the ball 48 times against Dallas. Uh, after you know, Sean McVay is a smart enough guy, as everybody knows, all anybody talks about how smart Sean McVay is. But he, he's a smart enough guy to say, "Look, this guy was great last week. We're going to keep leaning on this to an extent that maybe we didn't initially plan to when we signed him." And I think that's uh, that's a pleasant surprise because one of those highlights was a pass to Cooper Cup. Yep. Not playing, okay. hurt, out for the year. Their passing game's a little bit down from where it was early in the year. They missed that guy. Mm -hmm. Well, you talked about how many times they ran the ball. 48, I believe. Gurley and Anderson then set a Rams franchise record. 273 rushing yards against the Cowboys. So it worked. Yeah. It worked. Drew Brees, the big 4-0 today. Later on, we'll take a look at Brees' best plays of over 40 yards during his outstanding and, of course, future Hall of Fame career. And later, how a former Patriots quarterback coach influenced Tom Brady from the very beginning of his Hall of Fame career. I remember looking up at the clock and going, the clock is stuck in a minute and 43 seconds. Here. Exempt list pending further action. Reporters asked Coach Nagy about Hunt yesterday. Matt, if, if Ryan asked you your recommendation on whether or not the Bears as an organization should pursue Kareem Hunt, what would you tell him? So going back to what, what he said, there's one thing right now with Kareem, and and uh, and that's worrying about him as a person. Uh, uh, he's, you know, I, I talked to Kareem and as a, completely wanted to know how he's doing, and we had a, a good conversation. And here's a kid that that uh, that I spent a year coaching on offense. It's a it's a tough situation. I wanted to see uh, making sure that he's okay, but understanding too that you know the the situation that that happened is unfortunate for everybody, and 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 he knows that. So the only thing I cared about when I talked to him was literally his personal life, how he's doing, and uh, it was a it was a good conversation. He sounded good, but that's that's it. I mean, I, I the other stuff, that's not where it's at. It's about there's more to it than the than the, the football. So we we talked strictly on that. So here's a timeline of how we got here. Last February, police were informed that Hunt shoved and pushed a woman in a dispute at a Cleveland hotel. No charges were filed. Then in November, TMZ posted a video 
showing Hunt shoving and kicking a woman from that February incident. So the NFL placed Hunt on the commissioner's exempt list, and the Chiefs then released Hunt that same day. The NFL also investigating Hunt for two additional incidents. So before we can talk about where he might play, the question really is if he can play, because right now that is simply not the case, Dan. So walk us through what would have to happen for Kareem to even be eligible to play in the NFL. Well, first of all, the league's going to have to make a final decision on the length of suspension. Commissioner's exempt list is, uh, it, it has no end date. You, you, you're put on that pending an investigation and a final decision on discipline. So at some point, the NFL will officially suspend Kareem Hunt for a certain number of games. And I don't know what that number will be, but for the sake of this discussion, let's pick one and say six, right? So let's say they suspend him for the first six games of the 2019 season. Well, that's when teams can look and say, do we want to bring this guy in? What should it cost us to bring this guy in for only 10 games? Is this something that, that we feel good about as an organization? Have we met with this young man, and do we feel like there's remorse? Do we feel like you know, going forward he's going to be in these same kinds of situations? So there's a lot that still has to happen, to Matt Nagy's point, before a team can really consider bringing him into a camp. I think ultimately it does happen, but no one's going to move on it until they see what the league says about a suspension. Tim, you agree that we will see Kareem Hunt on an NFL roster next season? I'm not sure, to be honest. I, I, I don't think so. And I understand that he's young. He's a really talented player. Um, listen, locker rooms in general are very forgiving places. Um, you know, all of those things would, would, I guess, lead you to believe that maybe it does happen. But I know that the other thing is, like, video does ch kind of change everything. And, you know, Reuben Foster is on the Redskins right now. They're, they're, you know, and it was a very different situation, obviously, with, with – Kind of how things came out and so I think you just look at the fact that there's been video of Kareem Hunt and I think it's hard for people to get over. It is. Video though indicates the there's one one case which is Joe Mixon who was still drafted and as a productive player. But he also was a Bengals college now. player. I think age right. versus a guy that's currently in the NFL I think changes that. It may be. It may be. But this is a guy who's only 23 yeah. and I think you know we look at the Ray Rice situation that was a guy who was toward the end of his career uh, and I think that helped teams sort of say, you know, we're just going to ignore this. I think Kareem Hunt still has an ability to play football for a number of years at a high level that's going to entice somebody uh, regardless of the off-field stuff. Yeah, I think, you know, the fact that Matt Nagy got, you know, got in touch with him relationship-wise is really admirable to me. Just, you know, guys pretty low probably in his uh, life right now, and I think that, that, that communication is helpful. Uh, it'll be curious to see what happens with the rest of these investigations by the NFL to really see if he gets a second chance in an NFL locker room. Well, and I think you have to underscore the fact what Nagy said. Yes, he's spoken to him. They have a relationship. I mean, yeah. these are two men who have worked together, who had great productivity in Kansas City, and so there's a personal relationship there before anything else. Hunt became the sixth rookie since the 1970 merger to lead the NFL in rushing yards. That was in 2017. So really incredible value for a guy in the third round. What happens next? We'll have to wait and see. Still to come on NFL Live, the story of former Patriots quarterback Coach Dick Rabine and 143. Coach Rabine was my quarterback coach. He passed away in you know, the first in training camp. Coach Rabine was a tremendous influence on my life, on all the quarterbacks' life.